Politics cannot legislate morality. That is a lie. Politics legislates morality all the time. What do you think it was when politics legislated prayer out of school? When they legislated the Bible out of school? When they legalized abortion? When they legalized same-sex marriage? Is that not legislating morality? And by the way, let me go back to same-sex marriage because too many people misunderstand what that case was about, all about. It wasn't about same-sex marriage. It really was about the destruction of the traditional family. Because if you destroy the family, you destroy society. And it was about an infringement upon our religious liberties. Now, there was a man that came to America right after the American Revolution from France. His name was Alexis de Tocqueville. And he said, not until I went into the churches of America and saw their pulpits flame with righteousness did I understand the secret of its genius and power. And then he made a very sobering statement. He said, America is great because America is good. And if America ever ceases to be good, America will cease to be great. I'm going to repeat, we need to take this really to heart. America is great because America is good. And if America ever ceases to be good, America will cease to be great. This is where we are today. I mean, God, thank you for your mercy. Yes. Because this is where we are today. We are on the verge of seeing the destruction of America. Amen. We're seeing rampant immorality across the nation. Civility has gone out the window. We're seeing our values, our Judeo-Christian values, under attack daily. I'm going to repeat it one more time. America is great because America is good. And if America ever ceases to be good, America will cease to be great. I don't know about you, but I am sitting back waiting for it. I'm going to stand in the gap and I'm going to do everything I can to turn around this country. You know, there's a very sobering statement in the book of Ezekiel where God says, I look for one man, one man to stand in the gap that I may withhold judgment and could not find him. What an indictment. But there's much more than one here. And I'll tell you what, each and every one of us needs to say like the prophet Isaiah, hear my Lord, send me. Yes. Hear my Lord, use me. You've got to act like you are the only one standing in the God. Each and every one of us needs to do that. We have a country to save. Patron, Pastor Dietrich Bonhoeffer in Nazi Germany said, freedom in the face, silence in the face of evil. Silence in the face of evil is evil itself. Look at the next statement. God will not hold us guiltless. You hear what it says? God will not hold <coughs> us guiltless. Not to speak is to speak. Not to act is to act. Silence is not an option. Now, how long are we going to remain silent? But there's a much more important question, and it is this. Are we going to have to answer to God for our silence? I'll tell you what, that is also a sobering question. 
you know, the Bible says that we will have to render an account for every idle word we have spoken. I think the converse is also true. We're going to have to render an account to God for all the words we should have said, but we were too chicken to say it. Shout it from the housetops. Look at what Ephesians 4.11 says. Have no fellowship with the unfruitful <coughs> works of darkness, but rather reprove them. There's another translation which I like better that says rather expose them. Proverbs 17.15 says, He who justifies the wicked, or he that condemns the just, both of them are an abomination to the Lord. He who justifies the wicked. Sometimes we see wickedness, and because that wicked politician is of our political party, we stay mum. Or those that condemn the just. Or oh, are we so quick to condemn someone who is doing the right thing, but they're not doing exactly the way you would like to have it done. And we shall act them up and down and destroy them. We better get our act together. Because we have a habit of attacking each other and destroying each other. In Genesis chapter 11, verse 6, you have a very interesting passage of scripture. You have these people in Babel trying to build a tower to reach heaven. And in verse 6, God says, they are of one accord. And therefore, anything they set their minds to do, they can accomplish. There is power in unity, even for evil. The next time you see that, past that phrase is in Acts chapter 1, where it talks about the 120 in the upper room, and it says they were together in one accord. And that's where we saw the outpouring of the Lord with the Holy Spirit and the beginning of the church. We better get our act together and get in one accord. We need to realize we are not each other's enemies. <clears throat> Psalm 33, verse 12. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, and the people whom he has chosen for his own inheritance. I'll tell you what. God has chosen each and every one of us to stand in the gap. To be his representatives for righteousness. We have been given this country as a gift from God. And to whom much is given, much is required. We are stewards of this country. We better exercise that stewardship correctly. I want to leave you with one more verse. Galatians chapter 5, verse 1. And God said, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ has set us free. And do not entangle yourselves again with a yoke of bondage. There are others that are trying to put us in bondage. And I'll tell you what. Too much blood has been shed to give us our freedom. How many of you remember Braveheart, the movie Braveheart? Do you remember the last word of William Wallace? Freedom! Before? freedom! Thank you. God bless you. God bless America. God bless Texas.